It's been a long, hard road to the silver screen for Natasha Romanoff, the Marvel super spy with the code name Black Widow. Like any super spy, Natasha has her secrets. Thankfully, we've got all the details of her untold history for you right here. Black Widow made her first appearance in 1964, but if it weren't for the name, you wouldn't know it's her. Not only is Natasha missing her black cat suit and signature red bob, but in her debut, she's not the heroic spy you've come to know and love. She's evil all the way through. In fact, in her debut, Natasha doesn't even fight. During one of Iron Man's first adventures, he fought Anton Vanko, a Soviet scientist who's also known as the Crimson Dynamo, and then helped him defect to the United States. In Stan Lee and Don Heck's Tales of Suspense No. 52, the Soviet Union sends the Black Widow and her partner, the super-strong secret agent Boris Turgenov, to the U.S. to get revenge. While the Widow uses her feminine charms to seduce and distract Tony Stark, honestly, it doesn't take much effort. Boris attacks Vanko and steals his supersuit. The Black Widow is a little more active her next outing, Tales of Suspense No. 53, and she gets her own proper superhero costume in Tales of Suspense No. 64. Although it's a fishnet-heavy mask and cape ensemble, not the skin-tight jumpsuit she's known for today. Still, during these early appearances, Black Widow is little more than a Cold War-era stereotype. The glamorous and beautiful femme fatale who uses her looks to manipulate men into doing her dirty work. It'd be a while before Natasha emerged as a complex, capable, and fully independent character. Still, better late than never. You know Black Widow's most iconic costume, the form-fitting black suit. The bright red hair, those stylish and ultra-dangerous bracelets better known as the Black Widow's Bite. As it turns out, none of those belonged to her, at least not originally. In 1941, a costumed hero named Miss Fury debuted in newspapers' comics sections, and her outfit should look very familiar to Black Widow fans. Like Natasha, socialite Marla Drake slipped into a sleek black outfit, one made out of panther skin in Fury's case, when she stepped out to fight crime. Miss Fury wasn't the first female superhero, but she was the first female superhero created by a woman, and she quickly gained a number of fans. Legendary Marvel artist John Romita Sr. was among those fans in 1970. While illustrating Amazing Spider-Man, Romita learned that Marvel had the rights to the character. He told his Spidey collaborator Stan Lee that he'd love a chance to draw a Miss Fury book someday, and Stan suggested that they just make Black Widow into Miss Fury instead. Romita traded Miss Fury's mask for the Black Widow's shock of red hair, and the revamped Black Widow debuted in The Amazing Spider-Man No. 86. The look's been Natasha's ever since. Black Widow was Marvel's first female superhero, but there's a catch. She's not the Black Widow you're thinking of. The Black Widow that Timely created in 1940 was a psychic named Clairvoyant, yes, seriously, who lost her life after a seance went bad, only to be brought back to life to work as a superpowered servant of Satan himself. In fact, her whole gig was killing evildoers so her boss could harvest their condemned souls a little faster. Yeah, it's real weird. Clairvoyant only appeared a handful of times and never had a regular book to call home. The Second Widow, meanwhile, helped kick off the second volume of Amazing Adventures in 1970. Unfortunately, the Black Widow's first stint as headliner didn't last very long. While Natasha Strip blended stunning artwork with pointed social commentary, her Amazing Adventures co-stars, The Inhumans, proved much more popular, and the Black Widow's solo outing ended after eight installments. Thanks to writers and artists like Frank Miller, Brian Michael Bendis, Mark Wade, and Ed Brubaker, Daredevil has become one of Marvel's most popular heroes, especially among hardcore comic fans. In 1971, however, Ol' Hornhead was in trouble. His ongoing book wasn't selling all that well. Creatively, things were stagnant. Marvel originally decided to shake things up by putting Iron Man and Daredevil in the same comic, but Daredevil writer Jerry Conway came up with a different idea. As Conway remembered in a 2010 interview with Back Issue, I was a fan of Natasha and thought she and Daredevil would have interesting chemistry. I'm not sure what I based this on other than my desire to bring the characters together. I'm a sucker for redheads. Whatever his reasoning, he was right to do it. The Widow joined the man without fear in Daredevil No. 81 and stuck around for over 40 issues. She even got her name added to the title of the book in Daredevil and the Black Widow No. 93, where it stayed until No. 108. Sales rose accordingly, and with Black Widow as a co-star, Daredevil rediscovered its groove. During Black Widow's run on the title, Natasha and Matt Murdock started dating and moved to San Francisco. Allegedly showing an unmarried couple living together got Marvel in trouble with the comics' code authority. 
When writer Steve Gerber took over the book, however, it meant an end to Marvel's biggest power couple. When Matt's best friend, Foggy Nelson, was shot, Daredevil headed back to the Big Apple to help. Black Widow stayed behind. Speaking about the decision, Gerber said, I didn't miss her. Daredevil works better as a loner. In the movies, Natasha doesn't have any real superpowers. She's just really good at sneaking, fighting, and blowing things up. Like any spy worth her salt, Black Widow has lots of handy gadgets to help her out. But at the end of the day, it's her training, quick reflexes, and razor-sharp mind that lead the way to victory. You sure about this? Yeah. It's gonna be fun. In the comics, things are a little different. For the most part, writers and artists tend to attribute Natasha's superior abilities to her time at the Red Room, a Soviet training facility. One story, however, reveals that Natasha's got something a little more special running through her veins. In 2004's six-issue Black Widow series, Natasha learns that the Red Room brainwashed her and 27 other orphans, gave them false memories, and injected them with a special super soldier serum to craft them into weapons. Thanks to Natasha's chemical enhancements, she heals four to five times faster than a normal human, doesn't ever get sick, and ages much, much slower than she should. In addition, the Red Room developed a special pheromone spray that prevents its agents from attacking anyone who's wearing it, a product that Nick Fury's used again and again to keep Natasha in line. While the Red Room remains a major part of the Black Widow's origin story, her superpowers almost never come up, probably to keep the comics Natasha in line with her big screen counterpart. Although we've gotta say, the idea that the Widow gets by on her skills and wits alone is also just much, much cooler. Four years before Tony Stark jump-started the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Tomb Raider and Kill Bill proved that female action stars appealed to audiences just fine, and Lionsgate wanted in. The studio hired actor and screenwriter David Hayter, who'd just penned the scripts for the first two X-Men movies to bring the Black Widow to the big screen. Hayter's screenplay followed the comics pretty closely, and the writer was all set to step into the director's chair when Lionsgate pulled the plug. As Hayter explained, in addition to all those female-led action movies that did well, there were also movies in a similar vein like Blood Rain and Ultraviolet, which did not. Aeon Flux was the last straw. After that failed, Lionsgate decided not to go forward with Black Widow. That's a bummer for Hayter, who loves the character so much that he named his daughter Natasha, but it's even worse for the Widow's fans. While Natasha finally made her feature film debut in 2010's Iron Man 2, Black Widow stayed a sidekick for over a decade before finally getting that long-awaited solo feature. Natasha wasn't the first Black Widow in Marvel Comics, and she wasn't the first Black Widow in the company's cinematic universe either, although you wouldn't know if you didn't watch Marvel's Agent Carter, which, judging by the ratings, you probably didn't. On the series, Haley Atwell reprised her role from Captain America The First Avenger, while offering fans a glimpse inside S.H.I.E.L.D.'s predecessor organization, the Strategic Scientific Reserve. As one of the SSR's only female agents, Peggy Carter must battle sexism in the workplace, while also doing her best to topple Leviathan, a Soviet espionage agency with eyes for Howard Stark's genius and deadly inventions. Throughout the show, Carter butts heads with a Leviathan assassin known only as Dottie Underwood, who serves as Peggy's evil counterpart, and who also happens to be the MCU's first Black Widow. This is my surprise face. Agent Carter never actually uses the Black Widow codename for Dottie, but if you're paying attention, it's clear. And even if you're not paying attention, the show's producers later came out and confirmed the connection. Like Natasha, Dottie is a product of the Red Room training program. They even fight like one another. Once actress Bridget Regan realized where Agent Carter was taking her character, she studied Scarlett Johansson's fight scenes in order to make sure that both spies had the same style. At first, Joss Whedon and Black Widow seemed like a match made in heaven. Whedon rose to fame as the steward of complex and compelling female action heroes on shows like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel, and Firefly, and his geek cred is beyond question. If anyone in show business could get Black Widow right, fans seemed to think it'd be Joss. At the time of the first Avengers movie, Scarlett Johansson seemed to think so too. Speaking to CBS News, she said, Joss did not want the Black Widow to be the damsel in distress or just another pretty face or someone that was, you know, a woman that was incapable of holding her own. She just throws down and sweeps the floor. And when I read it, it was just like, oh, thank you, Joss. Things worked out pretty well for the first Avengers movie. The second, not so much. How'd a nice girl like you wind up working in a dump like this? Fella done me wrong. In Age of Ultron, Natasha gets a lengthy subplot dedicated to her budding romance with Bruce Banner, and at one point she stops to explain why they'd make a great couple. 
He's a monster, she says, because he's got the Hulk lurking inside of him. She's a monster, meanwhile, because the Soviet scientists in the Red Room sterilized her while transforming her into a super spy, robbing her of the ability to do her motherly duties. You still think you're the only monster on the team? That's a story point that's straight out of the comics, in which the Red Room's super soldier serum turns women's bodies against their own wombs, but fans still weren't thrilled with how the scene seemed to reduce a fascinating character to the sum of her reproductive parts. They let Whedon know about it, too. In the aftermath, Whedon quit Twitter and later tried to explain that the monster line was referring more to Natasha's past as a cold-blooded killer than her infertility. But it was too little, too late. The damage had already been done. Throughout the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we've got only glimpses of Black Widow's past life as a Russian assassin, but it's clear from those glimpses that her early years were far from easy. She was recruited, trained, sterilized, and taught to kill without mercy, and she eventually managed to overcome all of that to be a hero. In Avengers Endgame, Natasha must reckon with both sides of this existence. She notes early on in the film that she had nothing before the Avengers. She thinks of the team as her family and as her reason to keep trying to be a better person even in a post-Thanos world. When Natasha and Clint Barton are dispatched to Vormir to get the Soul Stone, we learn via the Stonekeeper, aka Red Skull, that her father's name was Ivan. This is significant because it's information not even Natasha herself knew until then. She was so ignorant of much of her family's history that her own father's name was a profound revelation, reminding her of where she came from and the redemption she was seeking to earn through her heroics. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite comic book superheroes are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.